first off to have you all here with us this evening. We have been looking forward to this talk very much here among the staff, um, and it's great to see that excitement that we have reflected in our community as well. Um, just a few little uh, business items. Restrooms are directly across the way. Um, follow the path to the building over there. And we've got some snacks and information up here. Information box is also up here. So um, we really appreciate your support, whatever you can give. Um, it makes these kinds of programs possible and supports all of the work that we do here at Things and um, the other organizations that we bring in do as well. So thank you. Um, and I am delighted to introduce Barry Gensinger. Thank you. <laughs> this evening um, from the Vermont Bat Center and his wife Maureen, um, tech support back here. <laughs> um, uh, they are the only licensed rehabilitator of the, all nine of Vermont's bat species. Um, so they have stories to tell. Um, and we are really excited. We just put up um, bat boxes here at Vins this past fall. So we're hoping that perhaps we will have some this over the course of the season, and uh, Barry has been a fantastic resource. I email him all the time, trying to get information. Where's the best place to put them? What color do they need to be? How high? He knows all of that. Uh, so he is really an amazing resource for us, and we are delighted to have him here tonight to share all of his knowledge for as much as we can soak up um, this evening. Without further ado. Thank you. So just to put things in perspective, the Vermont Bat Center is up in Milton. And if we think of the Vermont Bat Center along with VINS, ooh, that might be a little close, uh, and compare Vermont Bat Center with VINS, the entire Vermont Bat Center would fit in a space about this big. Because bats are only this big. So it's, it's really easy to have a space to take care of bats in. What we would like over time, we'll get, get that turned down. Over time, we would like to, to build a permanent center so that visitors could come. <laughs> there we go. So visitors could come to the center and see bats uh, that we are working with and rehabbing. Right now, the law says that no rehabbers can have general public come and visit their facility, especially those that deal in rabies vector animals, which is what bats are. That just means bats are animals that could contract rabies, uh, along with skunks and foxes and raccoons and a variety of other animals. So what we're hoping is over time we can get the law changed so that our center can become an educational facility and we can do lots of things with the general public and have them learn more about bats in a, a good classroom setting. But for now, we have a tiny little facility by comparison to VINS, and we are currently rehabbing either 33 or 34, we can't remember, uh, rehabbing 33 bats, then, and one of those happened to come from the Quinchy School, right over there, about as the bat flies, well, at, we'll go with as the crow flies, because crows fly in a straight line, bats kind of go like this, chasing bugs, uh, which is only about a mile and a half away. So we will be releasing that fella this evening, right out there, and uh, everyone can get a good close-up look at a cute little bat and see what it looks like. Uh, we also have some monitoring equipment that we use to listen to bats when they're making all of their usual squeaking noises, and we'll uh, get those set so we can listen to what this guy is saying, probably saying things like, let me go, you big idiot. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Up here on the table, along with the cookies, you probably noticed the cookies, but beside the cookies is one of our uh, Vermont Bat Center cards, so if you would like to pick one of those up, it has our website and our Facebook page on there, both of which are very difficult to remember, vermontbatcenter at gmail.com, and our website is Vermont Bat Center, and our Facebook is Vermont Bat Center. Uh, I also have two bat houses up here if anyone is interested in making their own bat houses. You can come and study those in great detail. 
And on our website, we have plans available for making your own. So with that as a inter basic introduction, my wife and I have been doing batty things for over 20 years. We've been working with Vermont Fish and Wildlife uh, and uh, rescuing bats and uh, just having a wonderful time. They're such fascinating animals. We're gonna start with a quick look at bats from around the world because most people don't realize out of all of the 4,400 species of mammals on this planet, bats make up just under one quarter of all mammal species. There are a huge number. Most people, this is what, when you say bat, this is what people think of. Kind of a dark brown, ugly looking thing. It flies around, it bites you in the neck, gives you rabies, does all of those evil things. But let's take a look at some of the varieties from around the world here. We won't spend a lot of time on this, even though we have pictures of all 1,400 different species, we won't look at all of them. So one of the things about this picture I, I like is this little part right here. If we look at the bat's wing, bats, <clears throat> bats are given the name by scientists Chiroptera. Chiroptera means hand wing. And a bat being a mammal, it has arms and legs and toes and fingers, just like we do. And here, if you look, is the bat's hand. Here's his elbow and his wrist and one, two, three, four fingers and a thumb sticking out right here. So when a bat wants to fly, he just stretches his arm out and opens up his hand and his hand forms his wing. He also happens to have fingers that are longer than his legs, which is really kind of cool. Okay, next one. Smallest bat on the planet is this little tiny thing often referred to as a bumblebee bat because it's just the size of a big bumblebee. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have this guy, one of the fruit-eating bats. It is an enormous little fellow. It weighs a whole two pounds and its wingspan stretches as far as my arms. Uh, if you've ever seen pictures uh, in Australia of their great uh, music amphitheater that they have there, they often show pictures of these fruit bats flying past this thing. Uh, they like roosting in the trees around there. A lot of bats can be distinguished as either insectivores or frugivores by looking at the comparison of eyes and ears. Bats with big eyes, this guy has big eyes, and kind of small ears. He's a frugivore. He uses those big eyes in the evening to go fly around and uses those eyes to see a fruit tree. He doesn't use echolocation to find a fruit tree because very rarely do fruit trees try and run away. So he doesn't need to chase them a lot. He just needs those big eyes so he can focus in. He then uses echolocation when he gets to the tree so he can find his way among the branches. So big eyes, little ears. On the other hand, big ears, smallish kind of eyes, indicate an insectivore. They use those big ears and echolocation to listen for the sound of echoes bouncing off bugs. So this would be an insectivore. Smallish kind of eyes, big ears. How about this guy? Big ears, smallish kind of eyes, and a funny thing on his nose, which is cleverly called a nose leaf because it looks like a leaf stuck on the end of his nose. We're not quite exactly sure what they do with that nose leaf. All bat species do not have a nose leaf, and it's not just insectivores that have a nose leaf, so it may or may not have something to do with echolocation. We're not sure yet. Someday we'll figure it out. Big ears, little eyes. Big ears, little eyes. You may note that the majority of the bat species are insectivores. So there are lots of variety of insectivores. And some are really strange looking. This bat, beautiful colors. This is one of the bats that we have here in Vermont. It's a gorgeous, multicolored bat. It has very dense, fuzzy fur, and you'll probably never see one. These guys like to forage above the canopy in the forest. So they are foraging high up 
All the bats that we see are chasing around insects at ground level where we are. This guy forages high up in the canopy, so it would be rare to see him. I love this one just with the color of the wings and the ears. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> one of my favorites. We have the same barber. Uh, this one, I think this one was used for, for those old enough to remember the movie Gremlins. I think this is the uh, artist's idea. And here's an interesting one. This is a fruit bat. It's the first of the pictures that's right side up for a bat. Because bats hang upside down when they're doing almost everything. So here's a fruit bat, big eyes, small kind of ears, hanging upside down. Uh, this particular bat loves figs, overripe, rotten figs. And this guy has gone up and chopped off a big mouthful of fig and is now sitting in a tree, chewing away on the fig. He's going to chew up all of the good part of the fig and then spit the part out he doesn't like. And you'll notice his tongue is out because look where the juice from the fig is running, right down into his nose. So he's trying to lick that juice off his nose while he's chewing away. Beautiful little thing. These are tiny, tiny little bats. They're about an inch and a half tall. They live under palm leaves. They take a palm leaf, which normally is folded up like this, and they chew along the spine. If you look closely, you can see where they've chewed along the spine of this leaf on both sides. And the leaf then folds down this way. And they hang underneath the leaf. And as the sun shines through the leaf, that white fur takes on a green color and they're almost invisible to predators. Ah, strangely enough, called the wrinkle-faced bat. And this one, of course, we immediately recognize for anyone who's read the book Stella Luna. There is Stella Luna right there in Mother. This bat will go out and forage looking for fruit. This is a frugivore, small ears, big eyes. So this bat is going to go out and take baby with her when she's out foraging. And of course, we know what happened when Stella Luna was not holding on tight enough. And this one... If you look really closely at this bat, here's the tongue on this bat. This bat likes nectar from flowers, and the tongue goes all the way down to there. The tongue is one and a half times the length of its body. It likes getting the nectar from very deep flowers, so it sticks its head in the flower and sticks out that long tongue to get at the nectar way down inside the flower. Okay, so that wasn't all the bats around the world. 1,400 would take us a while to see. But that gives you an idea of the variety, the huge variety of bats and the species. So let's take a quick look at, out of all those species, let's take a quick look at what they consume around the planet. What do bats eat? So. There are about 700, this number is now up to closer to 780. We're discovering new species of bats every year. Bats are the darndest things to try and study. They come out at night when it's dark. They fly very fast and they're silent. So it's hard to figure out where are they to start with. And once you figure out where are they, how do you follow them? And they're going like crazy. And of course they don't fly in a straight line from here to there. They're chasing bugs while they're out there, so they're all over the place. So there are about 750 or 60 or 70 different species of insectivores. They eat all kinds of things. They eat moths, they eat beetles, crickets, grasshoppers. They eat, here's, here's one catching a beetle. So this guy is going to fly down. This is one of the few species when he, when he gets on the ground, he can actually take off from the ground. He's going to fly down. Those wings are extended, and he's going to land right beside this beetle and trap the beetle with his wings. So the beetle can't jump away, and now he grabs the beetle and takes off. Very efficient 
at catching bugs. Here's one, found a cricket on top of a cactus plant. He's gonna fly by and grab it right off the cactus plant. They do that with their echolocation and they can accurately echolocate and decide is that something edible or not edible. So they can tell the difference between a cricket and a mosquito and if there's a cricket available, they'll take the cricket any day because it's a much bigger meal. This guy is eating a cockroach. We need more of those. And how about this next one? Ooh, ooh. Now that's talent. To be able to fly in and grab a scorpion without getting stung makes a good meal. So, our insectivores eat a wide variety of insects. Now we have 250 species of fruit-eating bats. And one of the interesting things, go ahead, one of the interesting things, they like over-ripened fruit. They don't like hard, crunchy apples like we do. They like over-ripened, squishy apples that they can grab a bite out of and squeeze all the good part out and then spit out what they don't like. So this guy is just hanging there, chomping away, eating what he likes, spitting out what he doesn't. There's our little figgy piggy again. They will very often grab a piece of fruit and fly to their favorite roosting tree and eat it in an area where they are comfortable hanging upside down and chopping away on the fruit. They sometimes will pick up very large pieces of fruit and other times, depending on, on what kind of fruit they like, other times pick up smaller pieces. Hold on this one. You all know what uh, we humans have been doing to the rainforest. We have been clear cutting the rainforest for years to harvest timber, to cut down to make uh, uh, space for all kinds of agricultural needs that we humans have. We want to plant things, we want the lumber, all kinds of things. So we go in and we mow down these fabulous rainforests, which by the way are the home to the majority of the species of bats on the planet. So we go in and we cut them all down. As it turns out, bats eat fruit that is loaded with seeds. Here's a piece of fruit that's just got tons and tons of seeds. And they fly over these clear-cut areas and the seeds go right through their digestive system and out with their droppings. And the bats are replanting the rainforests that we humans have cut down. I like to say we make the rainforest reseed and the bats reseed the rainforest. So, next we have nectar eating bats, those that like the nectar deep inside flowers. And the curious thing about them, there are a number of species of flowers and cacti that are only pollinated by bats. So here's one, this guy's gonna stick his head inside this flower all the way down here where the nectar is. And in doing that, his head is getting covered with pollen from the outer part of the flower. So this is where the pollen is, nectar's down here. Another one flying in. The uh, cacti out west, the agave, the saguaro cactus, are only pollinated by bats. So were it not for the bats doing their job for the past 10 million or 20 million years, we wouldn't have any tequila. That would be a shame. So here's one where the bat is going after the nectar down here, and as he's licking away, getting the nectar, his chest is getting covered with the pollen. So he's taking off and carrying that flower to flower and pollinating flowers as he goes. They love getting at anything that has pollen inside, or excuse me, nectar inside the flower. And this is what it looks like after a good night. So they have, during the course of the night, pollinated all of the flowers that they have visited, keeping many different species of flowers going, like this one. The flower opens upside down, and the bat is able to get on it and get at the nectar under the flower. And this next one, here is the pollen 
on this little protrusion coming out of the flower, but the nectar is in here, so the bat sticks its head in and the back of his head gets covered with pollen. Great symbiotic relationship between the two. Another one where the pollen is here, nectar is here. When the bat dives into that flower, the pollen goes all down his back. And as he goes flower to flower, he's carrying the nectar with him. So, 50 different species of bats that eat nectar. Then we have the carnivores. We have bats that eat a wide variety of meat. Here we go. One of the favorites is frogs. So this poor, look at the teeth on this guy, my gosh. This guy's gonna fly in, he sees that little tree frog, he comes right up and grabs a tree frog and keeps right on going. But he doesn't just limit his eating to tree frogs. He can catch small mice. He can kill, there, there are carnivore bats that eat a variety of things. Did you skip over that picture? No, no? I showed it real quick. Oh, okay. They eat big frogs, they eat small frogs, and they can catch lizards. They can catch, catch uh, skinks and uh, snakes. There's a snake that eats bats and a bat that eats snakes, so it's an even deal. All right, then we have bats that eat fish. You probably were not aware that Orvis makes little tiny bat fishing rods. Okay, never mind. It was a good story. She never lets me tell that story. Okay, so when a bat wants to catch a fish, how the heck does it know where the fish is in the water? Well, when a fish comes to the surface and grabs a bug, it makes ripples in the water. And the bat uses its echolocation to detect where those ripples are and it knows in the middle of the ripples, there's a fish. So, it flies along, and if you look closely, we've got another, another picture of this, but if you look closely at the feet, the feet have very long toes with razor-sharp toenails that are hooks, just like a fish hook. And he comes down over the water, and he drags his feet in the water right through that opening, and is able to grab the fish right out of the water. So, fish is right here, He's got his little feet hooked on it, and when he catches the fish, he heads off to his favorite fish-eating tree. Here he's got the fish chopping the whole thing, bones and all, and right here, you see those incredible toenails and those long toes that he uses to snag that fish. I think the story with the fishing rod was much better, but... Okay, so what's, what's missing up here? What's the last category? Blood. The vampires. We, of course, know that the only vampires that ever existed anywhere all came from Burlington. So, <laughs> so bats that feed on blood. Three species. The only place on the planet that they are located is in the north eastern area of South America, in the area that we refer to as Latin America. That's the only place they have ever been found. There have never been any uh, skeletal remains or indicators that they ever existed anywhere else. So, here's the deal. You might recognize this. It's a chicken's foot. Vampire bats get their blood meal mostly from chickens. They will occasionally get a blood meal from an injury on a cow or some other domestic animal where they can fly in and get the blood that is already open. But in this case, these guys are getting their blood meal from their favorite source, a chicken sleeping in a tree. So the chicken, wild chicken sleeping in a tree with its claws wrapped around the branch. The vampire bat comes up underneath the branch and sneaks up and uses its very sensitive nose to find where a blood vessel is close to the edge of that foot. And it licks and licks and licks to soften up the skin and then makes a tiny little nip, like a paper cut, just a little quick bite, doesn't even wake the chicken up. And then he licks and licks and licks, and his saliva has an anticoagulant in it. So the saliva allows another drop of blood to come out, and another drop, and the more he licks it up, the more drops come out. 
when this guy's done feeding, he's going to take off, and between the two of these, they will drink all the blood out of this chicken and it'll turn to dust. No. No? No. Oh. They, they eat half? No. A bat will eat about half a thimbleful of blood in its meal. So they take a little tiny, for those that don't know what a thimble is, consult your grandmothers. They know what a thimble is. So this guy, when he's done, flies away. This guy, rather than run the risk of waking the chicken up, is just going to come over to the same uh, spigot that he's been feeding, that the other one's been feeding on, they, and that one will lick and get his blood meal. When the two of them are done and they fly away, the next few drops of blood wash the anticoagulant out. Chicken's still sound asleep, and at the end, chicken wakes up the next morning, doesn't know anything happened, everybody's happy. <laughs> the problem with that is, when bats, vampire bats, take their blood meal from a cow, this has been happening for thousands of years, the farmers down in Latin America would see the bats on the cow, and the injury might have been caused by a wolf, as far as the farmer was concerned, this vampire bat ripped the cow open to get the blood. So they have, for many, many, many years, been going to caves that they knew had bats in them and burning the bats out of the cave by the tens of thousands. Well, the little problem with that is vampire bats don't go in caves. Vampire bats are solitary. They live all by themselves in hollow openings in trees. They don't live in caves. So they've been killing all of the bats for many years that eat bugs that cause problems with their crops because they thought that they were causing injuries to the animals. Uh, Bat Conservation International for many years, I don't know how many, 15 or 20 years, has run educational programs with the farmers trying to convince them you're killing the good guys and the bad guys did not injure your animals. That was some other much larger critter that did that. And this is one of my favorite pictures of a bat taking a drink. I can just imagine the photographer who spent his entire night sitting out there waiting for a bat to come by and the first 800 pictures he took, he got nothing. But he finally got one picture that was perfect. Actually, the way the photographer did this was he set up a whole ring of cameras around this pond and they were all connected to electronic eyes and every time a bat went by all the cameras took pictures. So at the end of the night he just went back and looked to see did I get anything? He was probably home having a drink while he, his cameras were doing all the work. So after they stick their tongue in and hit the water they get a big splash and they take right off again. We had a wonderful uh, experience last summer a bat came out of one of our bat houses and came swooping down across our neighbor's little um, swimming pool and took a drink and went around in a circle and took another drink, did that four times and then took off. And we thought, that was really cool. We got to tell the neighbors. So we called the neighbors and said, tomorrow at 7.30, go out and sit by your pool. There's a bat's going to come by and take a drink. So they said, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. So they did. They went out and sat with their two kids, and sure enough, out comes the bat out of the bat house, swoops down, four times takes a drink, and then disappears. So the next night, they invited all their friends over. They had like 20 of their friends over on their deck sitting by the pool. No bat. Never came back again. <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> all right. So that's a little bit about bats. Um, we'll talk just briefly about echolocation. Uh, echolocation for all the bats that we have here in Vermont is, is vital. That's what they use to catch their food. Uh, we're going to talk about echolocation because in order to be able to find bats at night in the dark, you need some way of listening for them. And the only thing you hear is their echolocation sounds. Unfortunately, those sounds are above our human hearing range, so we actually can't hear them unless we have some really cool device that we can use. So here we have a thing called a bat detector. This is old school bat detector. We've had this, I don't know, 15 years. 
works great. You turn it on, it listens for sounds that are above our human hearing range. So you point this out and a bat goes by and you hear it go beep, 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 beep as it goes by. Well, you only hear it if you dial in the correct frequencies. So if you wanted to listen for a big brown bat, you'd have to set the dial at 28. Uh, if you don't set it at 28 kilohertz, you don't hear anything because that's the noise that a big brown makes. So if a little brown goes by, you don't hear anything. So this was all great because most of the time we knew what we were listening for. However, this is the new technology. So this is old technology. This is new technology. It's called an echo meter touch. It listens for bats and tells you a big brown bat just flew by or a little brown bat or whatever. This little tiny thing plugs into an iPad or an iPhone and you can stand out and listen as you see bats flying around and go, oh, it told me what that was. And if we take this thing, we can plug it right into the, oops, plug it right into the port on our iPad. We can then listen and it automatically records what we're hearing. So I'm going to just play back something that we recorded of a bat going by. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Wait, let me turn the volume up. <laughs> that would be a big help. Okay, here we go. Wait for it. So that's a bat pinging, looking for bugs as it's flying. And as it's, as it's flying around, if we were able to record that and play it back on the computer, oh, I bet we're going to have to unplug so it doesn't play through HDMI. We're going to go dark for just a moment. Don't be nervous. Okay. So here's a bat flying by. Does not sound like a bat. It just sounds like a bunch of squeaks. It's actually thousands and thousands of individual pulses going by so fast that we can't distinguish one pulse from another. So in a period of one second, there might have been 10,000 individual pulses going out looking for anim uh, something to eat. This next one, it's much easier. And if you listen closely, you can tell when it catches a bug. Uh-oh. Yeah. Listen carefully. Now, I don't know whether you could hear it catch the bug, but this next one, it's really clear when this next one catches a bug. And these recordings were just recordings that were made with a uh, listening device like this, listening for those pulses as the bat flies by. Listen to this one. Caught a bug. Caught a bug. That increase in frequency of the pulse is the bat zeroing in on the bug in the dark. And when it gets right up to the bug, it grabs it and then continues on flying. So bats are extremely efficient. Some species can catch two bugs per second. They are that good at catching bugs. One or two. That only goes in one. This one? Oh. <laughs> no. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. See, there was no need to panic. So, if we were to take one of these listening devices out to some area where we wondered, are there any bats flying around? Of course, the best place to do that is in like a wet, swampy area where there's lots of mosquitoes. Your favorite way to stand around. And then you just listen. And if you use one of the new technologies and just hold it up. I like doing this because we got an extension for that plug-in thing so I can sit in the car and put that little thing on the roof 
And then I just wait and listen because I can then see without any bugs bugging me. So we, we'll actually take this out with us when we take our little friend out to let our, our little buddy go. We'll take that out and see what kind of things he's saying to us because he's probably going to be screaming at us. Okay. Where are we? Ah, let's talk about Vermont bats. Now that we've gotten through the preliminary stuff, we're, we're now down to Vermont bats, and if you have questions about any of the things that we're talking about, now's the time to just jump right in with your questions. So we have nine species of bats in Vermont. There are 44 species in the United States, nine species in Vermont. And out of those nine species, we put together slides here that have some critical information about them. Number one, up in this corner, there will be a notation about whether they are a threatened or an endangered species. And over here, some critical information about where they spend their time. The bats that we have here are either house bats that spend their winter time inside old buildings, getting under the insulation in an old farmhouse so they're on the warm side of the attic, or inside the walls of old buildings, or they get into warehouses that are heated during the winter and they can spend their winter there. Or, in the summertime, they will be in bat houses, in old barns, they'll be in your house under the eaves, any place that they can get to sp that they uh, would spend their summertime. You'll notice this particular one is also a cave bat. That is, some of the big brown bats will spend their time in a cave. Now, Big brown is kind of a misnomer here. If you look at the size, this bat weighs one half ounce and is three and a half inches tall. The fellow that we will release tonight is a big brown bat. So it's only this tall, tiny little thing, weighs a whopping 12, I think this guy that we're gonna release weighs 14 grams or thereabouts. We're gonna actually weigh him. I'll show you how we weigh bats so we know when we released him, how much did this guy actually weigh? We have been tracking his weight since we got him because that's important for us to know. So here we have Big Brown, it's a house bat. Here we have a Little Brown, he's a house bat. He spends his summers in houses just like the Big Brown did. But he is only two inches tall, much smaller bat. Clearly that's why he's called a Little Brown bat. So look where he spends his winter, in caves. And look over here. He's an endangered species. White nose fungus has gotten into the caves in the United States. And that fungus makes bats wake up because it makes them itch. Bats are supposed to hibernate in caves and sleep all winter. So they get into the cave, they go to sleep, the fungus gets on them and it makes them itch, it wakes them up, they go to sleep, it wakes them up, and they do that every week. They're waking up, instead of every two weeks, they're waking up way too often. And their body clock says, oh, here it is February, I'm out of fat reserve and I'm thirsty, it must be spring. So they fly out of the cave in the middle of February and freeze to death. Because there's no food, the temperature's 25 below. <sighs> so our cave bats are the ones that we will see up here. Next one, eastern small-footed. The difference between the eastern small-footed and the little brown bat is indistinguishable to the average eyeball. Unless you know, look at the feet. If it's got little tiny feet, it's a small-footed. If it's got a bigger feet, it's a, oh, that's why it's called a small-footed. It's a forest bat. Forest bats fly around in the forest. They would not be found in bat houses or in your attic. They would be found in old woodpecker holes and hollowed trees. So we call that a forest bat. Summertime in the forest, but look where it spends the winter. And look over here, another of the endangered species. Next one, northern long-eared. You notice this one looks just like that other one? They're brown with darker black on their wings. They all look almost exactly the same, except this guy has got longer ears than the other ones. So if you have one in your hand and you look at it and say, wow, that guy's got pretty big ears and he doesn't have small feet, oh, that's a northern long-eared. So another forest bat, 
spends his time flying in the forest, foraging all, on all the bugs that are in the forest. And look where he spends his winter, in caves. This one is not just endangered in the state of Vermont, but he is federally listed. He is in, endangered across the country now. The, the little brown bat, by the way, the one that we looked at earlier, used to be the single most plentiful bat in North America. Hundreds of millions of them. Now it is on our endangered species list and the endangered species list of many other states. It has gone from the most plentiful to a threatened and then an endangered species. Indiana bat, federally endangered. Forest bat, spends its summers in the forest, but look where it winters. All those that are wintering in the caves are the ones that are coming out in trouble because of that darn fungus. And look at this guy, he's a little one-third of an ounce. Tiny little guy. Another one, the tricolored bat. We call him tricolor because his hair is actually three different colors. And he's a forest bat that spent his winter in caves. That gets him on the endangered species list again because of the fungus. One-fifth of an ounce weighs four grams. That's less than a dime. Now we get to our other three remaining species. They are migrators. They don't spend their winter here at all. They fly south. We'd call them snowbirds, but they're bats, so we call them snow bats, I guess. So this guy summers in the forest, foraging high above the canopy, likes eating the bugs that fly very high. And then when the bugs start declining, they just go south and follow the bugs south, some flying all the way down to Tennessee or Florida. They go a long way. So these migrators, because they don't go into the caves, are not on the threatened or endangered species list. Here we have migrator, summer in the forest, forages high up. The only ones that I have seen of these three species have been ones that ran into vehicles of one kind or another as they were traveling from one place to another. A forested area over here, forested area over here, interstate going between the two. And they fly across and get hit by a tractor trailer, boom, as they go across. Or they bounce off somebody's windshield and you look around saying, what the heck was that? And it was a bat going by. So. Nine species, three are migrators. The cave bats are the ones that are endangered or threatened species. Okay, did I generate any questions yet? I never slow down, so I just keep going. Yes? Earlier you said that they can't take off from the ground. Yes. So if you should find one, where should you put them? That's an excellent question. Bats have wings that are solid like an airplane. And unless they are strong enough to generate enough air movement with their wings, they are stuck if they're on the ground. So we get calls every day. We found a bat. It must be injured because it can't take off. Well, no, it's not injured. If it's coming out of hibernation at this time of year and it was up in your attic, it ended up on the ground. It, now it's on the ground. You just need to get it up on something. So get a pair of heavy gloves and an old dish towel and slowly go up to it so you don't scare it and just gently pick it up and carry it off and put it on a tree. You don't even have to shake it out of the cloth. Just take cloth and all, put it on the tree and then walk away and leave it. And it will then wiggle its way out of the cloth and it'll be ready to go. But because it's on the ground, it's stuck. And remember, it's just coming out of a long hibernation. He's been sleeping in your attic since October. So he needs a little bit of help. The only time that we want to see those are when somebody calls and says, well, we found a bat on our deck. Our cat was sniffing at it. Bing, red flag. If your cat was sniffing at it, the bat's in trouble. The cat may have already gotten a hold of it. Make sure your cat's up to date on its rabies, and then we'll make arrangements that we get it so we can try and take care of it. Whether you think it's dead or injured or anything, always put on gloves. 
if there is any human contact at all. The rabies hotline needs to be called, we need to be called, the bat needs to be caught, confiscated, euthanized, and tested. That's the state law. Right. If there's any human contact. So please, whenever you're, whenever you find any, or they're in your house, or anything, please, gloves. Yeah. Yes? How much do they eat? You know, huh? Like, how much do they eat in a day, like, well, weight-wise? They eat approximately half their own body weight. Every day? Every day, of bugs. So if you, so let's try and quantify that. One big brown bat can eat a thousand mosquito-sized insects every hour. So if you had a colony of 15 bats living in a bat house or under the eaves of your house, that's 15,000 mosquito-sized bugs an hour times eight hours of the night when they're out flying around eating. They make an enormous dent in our bug population. So that's a good thing. Somebody else had a question. Yes. I read that um, people are worried because of, of the um, fact that there are not nearly as many insects as they used to be. Definitely so a problem. The, one, one of the issues for me is when we as humans say there are way too many mosquitoes in Dumberston. Let's hire a company to come in and spray to kill the mosquitoes. And we just willy-nilly spray to kill bugs. The bats eat those bugs, and they eat anything else that, that spray touch. And now they're consuming enormous amounts of these chemicals, and we're ending up doing inadvertent damage to the one thing that we shouldn't be doing damage to, and that's our insect control mechanism which is the bats. So I'm 100% I'm in favor of letting the bats do their job and put up with the mosquitoes that are seemingly growing everywhere. There are a lot of other species of bugs that are on the decline for a variety of reasons and hopefully the bat populations will continue to thrive. Yes? Um, why don't the bats Say the last part of that again. Is there something like in their code, I guess, that telling them that they shouldn't go in houses? Well, little brown bats are colonial bats, and they go into a cave, and in that cave, if you were allowed to go into that cave in the wintertime, you might see clusters of a thousand at a time, and throughout the cave, that cluster might multiply to 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 because they like those colonies of bats. They will go into summertime housing developments. They'll go into their own housing development. Like you put up a big bat house, and if the little brown bats like it, then one, two, five, fifty. This bat house right here can hold 300 little brown bats. It's not very big. I'll, I'll show you pictures of this in a minute. Uh, so the little browns like the colonies, and those are the, the, the colonial bats are the ones that go into caves, and they form huge colonies. Well, unfortunately, the, the flip side of that is they go into there, and the fungus gets on them. And the fungus wipes out entire colonies. Greeley Mine, 25,000 bats in the survey in 2007. And out of all those bats, two years later, there were 15 live bats observed in the cave. All the rest were dead from the fungus. The fungus gets on them, makes them wake up, they fly out of the cave, they freeze to death. So, it would be great if they would smarten up and go, hey, let's go live in that guy's house. But 20,000 moving into your attic would not be a good thing. <laughs> yes? Is there a way to encourage the bats to colonize a bat house rather than a private house? You, you could do what my son has done. I gave my son a bat house years and years ago. He put it in his garage. It's still in the garage, and he can't understand why there are no bats in it. If he'd take it out of the garage and put it up on the side of the house, he might have better luck. If you put up a bat house, 
Bats are always looking for a place to roost. And if they find your bat house and it's easier to get into that bat house than it is to wiggle up underneath the eaves and get into your attic, they'll move into the bat house. Case in point, we put up a big bat house at Shelburne Farms, right outside the inn at Shelburne Farms because they were having a problem with bats in the attic of that big old building that had been there for like 150 years. We put it up in the first five years, there were no bats in it at all. Suddenly the next year, there were 100 bats in it. Now, there are 450 or 500 bats in it, and the colony is growing. It is the largest individual bat house colony of little brown bats in the state, because they like that bat house now. Someday we better build them a new one. And there are ways of excluding them from your house. Yeah, if we can, if we can get them a house to live in and they discover it, then we exclude them from getting into your house and they'll stay in the bat house. That's the theory. <laughs> yes? At some point just before 2006, somehow spores from this fungus came from a cave in Europe over to the United States, either on a caver's gear or a tourist Somehow, the spores of that fungus came over and ended up in one cave in Albany, New York. Uh, let's go to the white nose syndrome progression. Look at this. This will show you what an uncontrolled invasive species can do in a very short period of time. Next slide. So, first discovered 2006. Go ahead to the next one. This is a lot of blah, blah stuff. So 15,000 in Haley's cave, then seven, then 1,000. 92% of the bats died in two years. Next one. That's morbid. Next one. This is what it looks like outside one of those caves where there are just thousands and thousands of carcasses of bats. Next one. So here we go. Year one, Albany, New York, right there. Year two. It had spread from Albany to these caves right here. And here we are, started in 2006, this is 2008. Now, watch the progression as she quickly flips through these 2009, 10, 11. You see what's happening and how fast this thing is moving. Keep going. Keep going. And then, all of a sudden, this next one, next one, you got it, boom. Uh-oh. How did that get there when it had been stopped by the Rocky Mountains? Don't know. Next one. And they don't know what's causing the fungus. Well, we know what's causing the fungus. We don't know how to stop the fungus. Yeah. So we got this fungus, it's now everywhere in every cave east of the Rocky Mountains. But since it's not killing every bat, are the bats that are in, apparently immune to it, they must be passing on their genetic immunity. Yes? Well, it's not an immunity as much as it is a robustness of their physique. The tougher bats seem to be surviving. The weaker of the species got killed off in 2007, 2008 by the thousands. And now we're seeing occasionally bats still coming out of the cave and they are still in trouble. Uh, but we're, the, it appears as though they are making progress in their own ability to survive the fungus. Now, could we find some way of killing the fungus? Well, yeah, we got a million ways of killing fungus. The problem is we kill all the fungus, even the ones that are good for the cave. So we can't just willy-nilly go in and kill off the fungus. Yeah. If this fungus... Oh, you're next. If the fungus came from Europe, does that mean European bats have resistance to it? Yes. The European bats seem totally unaffected. Now, we don't know whether that took two years, ten years, a thousand years, ten thousand years, because the bat species there and the bat species here are the same, but the continents have kept them separate. So. We don't know whether we're in for a 10,000 year recovery period. I know that 
in Aeolus Cave outside of Dorset, there used to be a quarter of a million bats. Now there are fewer than 15,000. And if every group of bats is half male and half female, and half the females have babies and half the babies get killed before their first year, how long is it going to take for all of those bats to repopulate the cave? Yes, ma'am, you had a question. How does the fungus get on the bats? The fungus is in the cave, everywhere in the cave. So it's on the walls of the cave. And when the bat hangs on the wall and sleeps for the winter, the fungus is right there. And it gets right on their skin and it grows into the skin of the bat. So that's what makes the bat itch. So it wakes up and it tries to scratch and tries to clear the fungus off. Then it goes back to sleep. Then it wakes up and goes back to sleep. And it does that so many times that it burns up all of its stored fat. Remember, remember we're talking about something that it only weighs to start with half an ounce or less. Yes? Yes. And then they get in the house. Yep. And I don't know what to do. Well, the first thing to do, one of the issues was slate roofs. Keep in mind, bats are little tiny things. So where two slate tiles on a slate roof overlap, there is a little gap, that, a little triangular gap between the two slates on the end of the row. And the bats easily fit right in there. And they wiggle their way in until they find an opening in the boards that go into the attic. And then they drop down in the attic, perfectly happy. Excluding them is a major task because every one of those little overlapping tiles on every juncture of the roof have to be dealt with. So it's a very difficult thing. And the best way to do that is to get one of the companies that is an expert at excluding bats to take a look. <laughs> and they. Yeah, they probably said, ooh, you got a problem. <laughs> so if you want some bats, <laughs> Yeah, the best thing to do, of course, is put up a bunch of bat houses and hope that they realize, ooh, let's go live in those bat houses. Yes? So do, in the summer, do little brown bats and, or different species of bats live together in, in their house? It would be unusual, not impossible, but unusual. It's usually big browns in one area and little browns in another area. So it would be unlikely to have a whole bunch of little browns and a whole bunch of big browns in your same attic or in the same bat house. Yes? Since uh, the Europeans seem to have a genetic immunity, is there any thought about recolonizing, using them to well, recolonize our population? One of the initial thoughts was, let's get those bats and bring them over here and see what we can do. But somebody said, well, we've done that about 50 times in the past. We have brought species from one location to another and it's been a disaster. So we're not even gonna think about that. So it, it's, the same it seems like it would be a good idea. Are they the same species? They are the same species. The question would be, how, how much do we wanna risk the fact that we've screwed around with the planet so many times, that might not be the smartest thing to do. I, I, I'm not one who studies these. There are scientists that have been studying this phenomenon for the past 13 years, and they ha don't have any solutions yet. It's just a tough thing. Uh, how are we doing? Okay. If anybody had to go at 6.30, you're late. <laughs> Yeah, we do. Uh, let's go uh, close this one and go to uh, the effect of white nose on bats. This, this will give you an idea of what happens to a bat. When, when a bat comes out of Aeolus Cave, and it happens to be coming out of Aeolus Cave in the middle of winter when one of the scientists from Fish and Wildlife is going up there to check on their equipment, they are allowed to pick the bats up and bring them to us. So we occasionally will get bats with white nose fungus on them that have been 
chased out of the cave by that continuous itching and all. And so they, they go up, bring us black bats, and this is what happens. So, next one. Here's a bat that we got in from Aeolus Cave. If you look very closely at this, you'll see right here, there's a tiny little pucker on the wing. And over here is a little tightness right there and right there. Looks totally innocuous, not a problem at all. This is on April 10th. Look at the next picture, April 26th. The fungus grew into the skin, the bat has a very strong immune system which attacked the fungus to get those darn dendrites of the fungus off its skin and in doing that destroyed its own wings. So here on the 26th, the wings have completely fallen apart, but you're allowed to go, ooh. Ready? Next one. Ooh. Look at this. This is that same wing. There was nothing but bones. And here it is, May 9th. Ooh. Next one. And here we have fully regrown wing tissue. The bat is trying to learn to fly with brand new wings and newly developed muscles. And that's what we do. We take care of them and get them to the point where they're flying again so they can be released. So they can recover. The problem is they come out of that cave in February when it's 20 below zero and they die in a matter of a day or two. So if they just came out right when the fish and wildlife people happen to be there, then we can get them. We have three right now that are flying beautifully. They're eating like crazy. They are healthy and strong and they are ready to be released. So they will, sometime in the next two or three weeks, they will go back down to Aeolus and be released where they will then resume their normal activity. Yes? What do you feed them? <laughs> we, we feed them mealworms. A lot. A lot of mealworms. We order mealworms 5,000 at a time. And when our bats are coming out of hibernation, they eat about 20 a day. So we have 30, let's say we have 30 bats eating 20 mealworms each a day. And we'll keep them for a week and feed them to bulk them up. So when we let them go, we know they're in good shape. So we go through a lot of mealworms. Our mealworms are all uh, powdered with uh, calcium and vitamins so that they are getting a good, well-rounded uh, diet. And, uh, I was wondering if they ever have any sort of wounds elsewhere other than the wings. Uh, they will get the same fungus on all of the hairless parts of their body. Okay. And it so, as easy, like it can heal? Like yes, the, the term white nose fungus came because the very first people that saw this observed the fungus growing on their noses mm -hmm. and the fungus is just a white fuzzy fungus. So that's where the term white nose fungus came from. Yes? The bats that might potentially survive the winter in the cave and they come out and it does that to their weight, can they survive that or do they need to be in someone's care in order to get through that? Good question. We don't know the answer to that. Let's take a bat that made it all the way through to May, came out of the cave. Are their wings going to now fall apart? Because if they do, they can't possibly survive. So we don't, we don't know the answer to that. I did a presentation at, uh, with a bunch of scientist people. Nobody had ever seen that series of slides that you just saw. Nobody knew that they could regrow the wings. As far as they were concerned, bats came out, died, fell on the ground, and raccoons came by and ate them all. That was it. And now they see these pictures and go, my gosh, they can survive. The other curious thing is big brown bats that hibernate in those very same caves come out of the cave with no fungus on them. Why doesn't the fungus like big brown bats? Don't know yet. Working on that one. Yes. Do the, the bats that live in caves and um, congregately, do they have a social organization? Not a social organization, just a big crowd. So they don't have any hierarchy or anything like that, just huge numbers that are crowded into the cave. Sometimes in clusters of five, six, seven thousand at a time. Yes. Oh, yes. How do you get the bats to eat the medicine? To eat. 
Bats are very curious things, and when you hold a mealworm up in front of them, they will crunch it right up. As soon as they realize it's food, uh, we'll feed this guy a mealworm before we let him go. We're going to turn him loose in about five minutes. Uh, so you'll see, and we'll give him a little bit of water, make sure he's ready to go. If he is very active and looks like he's going to fly right out of my hand, then I'll let him go flying out of my hand. Otherwise, we'll put him on a tree and we'll let him climb up the tree. And when he's ready, he can take off and go when he wants to. Yes? If they have um, white nose and you cure them and re-release them, are they immune to it? No. They will go back into the same cave and hang on the same place in that cave that they were in before. They always return to exactly the same place in the cave. They will get reinfected with the fungus. We have yet to find one of the bats that we rehabbed that we got back again. So we don't know whether they are coming back in better shape, worse shape. All of the bats we release have a band on them with a number. So we know, is it one of ours? Is it one of Fish and Wildlife's? Where did it come from? And we also um, inoculate them. We give them a rabies vaccine before we uh, release them. Our bats are the healthiest bats on the entire planet. <laughs> Uh, do, do one real quick thing of uh, the bat rehab facility. I just want to show you what our facility looks like because compared to this, it is enormous. <laughs> so, when we first began this project, <laughs> Fish and Wildlife came to us. <laughs> we, we had just moved from one place to another, South Burlington up the Milton, and Fish and Wildlife said, can you take care of a bat for us for the winter? We didn't have anything but boxes, so we made a box. That was our very first facility in 2011. We then needed some place for them to hibernate. So when my wife went out shopping one day, I took all our white wine out of our cooler and made it into a little bat hibernation area. See this little guy right here? And that guy spent the winter sleeping in the hibernation cave. 60% humidity, 45 degrees. He loved it. It took me a week to realize the cooler was gone. <laughs> Well, I had to drink all the wine because we couldn't have evidence. <laughs> Next one. So we grew from there to a large space with lots of cages. We now have 30-some uh, cages uh, that are each cage. Next picture has in it all of the, depending on the species, all of the things that bats like to hide in. Some like hiding underneath a cloth. Some like hiding in a pocket. They all have heating pads on the back so we can keep them warm if we need to. Uh, they all have food and water dishes. Everybody just is, this is like the luxury. <laughs> Next one. We have bigger uh, cages. These are, are much larger cages for the little brown bats because little brown bats that come out of that cave are with us for a long time. Uh, the other guys, when we get big brown bats in in October, we make sure they're healthy, we keep them there, and then we put them in our, our, our hibernation area so they sleep for the winter. Uh, this fellow that we brought down here has been sound asleep for months, and he's coming out of hibernation. He's been eating like crazy, and he's ready to go. But, so he doesn't need a bigger cage. The little browns need a bigger cage. We can create an isolation area if we need to by enclosing a section of our enormous facility in plastic. This is where our little browns are now. It's, uh, it's seven feet high, four feet wide, six feet long. And it's an enclosure with a padded floor and food and little bat houses in there for the bats to hang on to. We have an outside enclosure that is 16 by 16. It is predator proof. That uh, galvanized fencing goes down a foot into the ground. So nothing gets in there that we don't want in there. And uh, when the bats need to really get out and get some exercise before release, they go out there. So the door is always locked. Yes. <laughs> and we also keep people out of it. <laughs> this is our hibernation area. And inside, row after row after row of cages with sleeping bats in it. So it is now completely filled. We have a video surveillance system that allows us to watch the bats, bats being little tiny things and frightened of anything big like us, as soon as we walk into the area where they are, they disappear. They run and hide underneath their cloth. 
but we can now watch them and see, are they behaving normally? Do they look healthy? So we can video, uh, use our video system to watch them wherever they are. And is that it? Oh, this gives you an idea of what we had for intakes. We're now, uh, this uh, 2000, I don't have 2018 and this year on here yet, uh, but we're up to 90 something this year. Okay. So that's what we do at the bat center. A huge, huge facility. <laughs> Enormous. Yes. Do the bats ever try to bond with you? No. They, the only bonding they do is when they hear me come in and start rattling mealworms, they know food's coming. They don't give a damn who it is. <laughs> the, lo the worms are alive. They, they will eat frozen ones, but they're too expensive. We're cheap. Slide said something like training back. Training, like training an animal. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's why. Just recently? No, no. Sort of the oh, 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 oh. Okay. Some of the pictures that you saw of a bat grabbing a bug off a cactus plant, that was a trained bat that Merlin Tuttle from Bat Conservation International trained to fly down and pick up a, a cricket off a cactus plant. And he did that with a little clicker. And so he would click and put a bug on top of a cactus plant. And the bat would echolocate and see that there was a cricket there and fly down and grab it. Well, after doing this for three or four times, he clicked the bat one. So those were trained, several of those pictures were trained bats. That bat that I said, oh, he's going to use the wings to trap that. The video of that little clip is put the bug down, click the clicker, bat comes down, boom, grab it and fly away. So they are extremely intelligent. They have about a 100 word vocabulary that they use among themselves. The only thing I ever hear is, let me go. That's <laughs> all they ever say to me. Yes. Instagram and often they're baby bats yeah. and they do look uh, or you know, they're touching them with people and they, yeah. the bats seem um, to be friendly, the, the caretakers. Well, they're, 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 not, they're not afraid of them. Uh, when we hand raise babies, baby bats are tiny. Take a look at these pictures. Uh, go to the next one. That's a baby bat. It weighs about 3.1 grams. It's about this tall, for those that can't tell, it's about this tall, little tiny thing, and we feed them very carefully with tiny little nipples. Next picture show me. Yeah, we have tiny, tiny little nipples, and we give them a special formula. Uh, you'll notice this guy has white tips on his ears. That's not a fungus. That's us covering his ears. We have 12 bats, so we have to keep track of which one do we feed? <laughs> Did you feed two red? <coughs> no, I fed red white. Oh, look. <laughs> Baby bats, when they come in, are high maintenance. We feed them every hour around the clock until we're sure that they're going to survive. And they, they do respond to your voice. If, if he comes in, to the enclosure and they're little and we've had them since they were a day old they will know why he's there and 95 percent of the time they'll come out from underneath the cloth and wait for him to put the mealworms in the cage because he they know if they hear him they're going to eat and just to emphasize how smart bats are if you had to leave at quarter of seven, you're late. Um, <laughs> we had a bat that we raised to a pup. We put him out into that big outdoor enclosure. He, we fed him out there until we were absolutely sure he was flying, echolocating, and catching bugs. And then we just opened the door. And he was with a group of 12 yeah. that we did that year. So everybody would go, come and go as they please. We kept mealworms out there. And eventually, they all flew away. Except this one. This one stayed there and stayed there and stayed there. Going out at night, coming back, going out, coming back. And then about October, we go out there and 
little bugger is sound asleep inside the little bat house of you out there. Figuring I'm going to hibernate here. It's a good deal. <laughs> well, he would have frozen to death, so we brought him into our in, inside hibernation area where the temperature is always 45 degrees. Next spring, we put him out there. Away she goes, back and forth, in and out, all winter long, or all summer long, eating, having a good time. Next fall, there she is, right back in the in little bat house again. Brought her in again, kept her for the winter, took her out the next spring, let her go. Finally, after three years, she decided, okay, I can live on my own now. <laughs> so this guy here, here's a case in point. We got a cup here full of mealworms, and we got four bats right there. There's another cup right here, and another one, and another one. So these four guys all dive in, and they're all eating all the mealworms out of this cup. And as soon as the cup's empty, all four of them go right over here to this one and eat all the mealworms. If you pick one of them up and move them over to the other cup, he'll go right back where the other guys are. I don't know whether they think, oh, they're, they're getting a better deal over here. So they're all eating out of one cup. It's crazy. All right. Any more questions? Yes. Most bats have one pup. There are some species that have twins, but most bats have one. Yes? I was going to ask too about that. Um, where do they breed and gestate and give birth? Generally, breeding occurs just prior to hibernation. The female stores the sperm and does not fertilize the egg until springtime and will not fertilize the egg until she is sure food and water are available. Then the egg is fertilized, and five weeks later, we have a baby. Five weeks? Yeah. And where does she give birth? Uh, wherever she's sank. So in a cave or a bathhouse? Well, it would, be, it would be in a bathhouse or in an attic space in the eaves. Uh, the the uh, forest, forest bats would be in the No. No. When a baby is born, the baby is born and just hangs up. The mother just puts the baby there, goes out and eats, come back and feed the baby. Uh, all the bats all nurse their babies, and they go out, and come back, and go out, and come back during the course of the night. Do yep, mammals just like us. They're <coughs> often asked, "How do you tell a male from a female?" Well, the same way you can tell a male from a female. <laughs> the males have the penis, the females don't. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go bring our cage out to the back. Uh, to the area over here, and we'll get all of our stuff. Those that can stay are uh, welcome to stay. So we have. A, we're going to weigh this guy. We like to weigh him just before we release him, so we know how healthy they are in terms of weight. Uh, so this guy is going to get weighed. You you may see pictures on the internet of people from other rehab organizations that handle bats without gloves on. We never handle bats without gloves. Even the smallest species that can't bite very hard should never be handled without gloves. So I just have regular garden gloves and nitrile uh, outer gloves. This guy can bite me and pinch, but he can't bite through material. Well, we'll get it set up. How about that? So I brought some mealworms if anybody would like a little snack. No? Oh, maybe we aren't going to weigh him. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Just took a minute. Okay, but it's not too deserved. Oop. Did I get any more? No. I'm trying to get a little water out of here. There we go. That's it. Okay. 
This doesn't like being <laughs> moved around. No. Uh, you can put it right on there. So, if you want to come look. Oh, so this is a big brown. <laughs> Huge. And you can probably hear he is very angry. So he's yakking away. <laughs> saying, let me go. We're going to just see if he wants to take a little drink. He doesn't know he's about to go on a long flight. So we'll see. Oh my god, he's so cute. Yeah, he's so little. He just automatically know where to Why go. do you let him go he at night and not in the, earlier in the day? Automatically knows where to go. He likes to fly at night. So he's nocturnal. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So we'll see if we want a little snack before we leave. Is it asleep? <laughs> okay. Oh, he's wide awake. He's debating whether he wants to eat it or not. He, he can hear us. <laughs> so how did this one come to you? From the Otto Queechy School. The question was, how did you get the, the this bat specifically? This bat came from the school uh, just over the hill there. Out of yes, yeah, that's was, where I go. Uh, he was flying around, or uh, no, I guess uh, they came back from a weekend and found him on the floor. Oh. Um, and weren't sure what to do with him, so I had already been there and, and done a program for them. And they called and said, what should we do with him? And they said, well, let's see if we can get him up to me and we'll take care of him. Is that a tag on him? That is a band with yeah. a number. The number is unique to this bat. So if it is ever found again, all right, you've had enough. He probably wants to go. Uh, we would know where it came from. Is there wouldn't be any bigger? question. Pardon me? It, will he get any bigger? Nope, Batter. he's full grown. He'll Batter. get fatter, yeah. Batter, but not bigger. He's actually pretty <laughs> fat now. How long do they live? Uh, the longest known is 36 years. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. this little guy is ready to go. Did, so, did you weigh him? We did not weigh him. Weigh him. We're having our, a little trouble with our. We're going to see if our scale will scale pay attention will this time. Pay attention. <laughs> 1473. 1473. 1473. Don't like being weighed. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to see if he is interested in flight. Yeah, you might want to if, take him away from the. Yeah, I'm going to move down this way. Okay. And we're all going to stay up here. If he's interested in flight, yeah. he will be gone in a flash. But if he's not, he'll sit in my hand. There he goes. Now the curious thing is, he will fly around until he gets his bearings. And once he gets out of this immediate area, he'll be able to determine where am I? Oh, I know where I am. And he will head right where he wants to be. Do they you have know? Like that? You. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, that was thank fascinating. You. This was really very exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's not often we get to have a release at the same time we have a program. That is fabulous. <laughs> That's great. Yeah.